Good morning. It's been three years since I've been here in person, like many of you, uh, and that means it's also been about three years since DHS selected Elastic and ECS to, to help them with the new continuous diagnostics and mitigation dashboard. I've had the pleasure of supporting the program for over six years now, so I've seen a lot of changes, uh, and I'm thrilled to be here talking to you today about what we're doing, where we're going, and all of the exciting stuff that the future holds. So three years ago uh, was pre-pandemic. Uh, mom genes were still just for moms. And the thought of an extensible, scalable, uh, interoperable system as the CDM dashboard platform was still very new. So for the past three years, our team has been working incredibly hard with DHS and all of our partners, many of you in this room, to, to build the new ecosystem. And I'm thrilled to talk a little bit about what we're doing here today. All right, so we're gonna talk about where we've been, what's changed over the course of the past three years, where we are today, how we're enabling operational visibility, which is really connecting the data with the people that are making decisions about how to better protect federal networks, and where we're headed, how we're gonna put all this together, and I have a, a description of a use case for you in terms of how we can use these systems. So here we have the DHS Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program Overview. This is a slide that has not changed much in the program's history. Uh, the CDM program just celebrated its 10-year anniversary, so like Elastic, I didn't realize they were birthday buddies. And over the past 10 years, a lot has changed, but their mission has remained the same. It is to help federal agencies defend and protect their networks using tools and sensors and data. So the program capabilities that you see listed here include agency and federal dashboards, asset management, identity and access management, network security management, and data protection management. The dashboard is really the common link for all of these things. So we are taking a lot of data from a lot of disparate systems, tools, and sensors, and we are making sense of it at scale so that our cyber defenders can also defend and interpret the data at scale. This level of access is really unprecedented in the federal government, and I'm gonna be talking today about the scale and the scope of these systems. Complementing the upgrade in technology for the dashboard has been a rapid expansion in the policy and the role that CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, plays in helping agencies defend their networks. They've really evolved from a risk advisor to more of a true partner and evolving to that of an administrator and helping to drive down risk across federal networks. I used to say that technology was the easiest part of CDM, and I still say that, but our job has gotten a little bit easier in the sense that we've had some dramatic policy revolutions that have uh, created a clearer path to success in partnership with the agencies. For CDM, the executive order from 2021 on improving the nation's cybersecurity was a hell yeah moment. Uh, it included a lot of provisions around how agencies should work together, how they should work with CISA to share information, to better protect networks at scale. And it really paved the way for a lot of what we've seen happen in the industry over the past 18 months. M2201 that you see depicted here describes the requirement for an endpoint detection and response capability deployed across the federal government. That's also an initiative that the CDM program is leading. And M2131 is all about improving how the government monitors for cyber incidents and reports that upon those cyber incidents to CISA. So in each of these cases, you see examples where CISA is becoming empowered and emboldened to do more for the agencies that it supports, and the CDM dashboard and CDM systems are helping them to do that. Okay, so generally that's what's been happening since 2019. We have a new dashboard. We have a evolving and rapidly growing and expanding role in CISA, and some of us have new genes. Here we have the CDM functional architecture. So this is again um, a, a slide that has been evolving over the past few years as we continue to build onto these systems. So at the bottom here, we have very diverse and distributed agency networks. And on those agency networks are tools and sensors that are collecting all sorts of data about what's happening on endpoints. That data is being normalized and aggregated and aligned to a common data schema. So what's happening is we're taking information that might be coming from 
uh, a tenable Nessus scan, you know, a four scout log, a, a McAfee agent, and we're combining it and interpreting it in a way that provides a complete picture of the security on a particular endpoint. And then we're also categorizing it in ways in which security leaders can make sense of it at scale. In the agency dashboard, we're really creating a, both a bi-directional framework for communication with the agencies, as well as that common schema for talking across agencies in terms of cyber risk. The federal dashboard, this is the big elastic logo that you see at the top of the screen here, sits at DHS and enables access to all of the agency dashboards from a single pane of glass. Today, there are 93 agency dashboards deployed. That is a lot of work. I see Booz Allen is here. Kudos to you guys, you guys have a lot of those. Uh, and the way that we are interpreting, or the way that we are leveraging access to all of those agency dashboards from the federal dashboard is through an elastic capability called cross-cluster search. This is a newer uh, capability that we are leveraging at scale at this point. It is the largest deployment of CCS to date. Uh, and essentially, we're able to connect to all 93 of those agency dashboards, you know, close to a million federal assets and to dynamically query and report on information that is happening on those agency networks. A couple of the benefits of this approach are that we're not moving data. So we're leaving data resident at the agency. And as you can imagine with an, an architecture of this scale, that, that type of distributed search capability results in not only significant cost savings, but also better security. So that has been something that's been important for us to preserve. Uh, the other thing that we're able to do through this architecture is actually push information back down to the agencies. So CISA in its role as a risk advisor and, and shifting to become you know, an administrator and a partner of risk with the agencies is really all about taking that per perspective that CISA has that is uniquely theirs, that is their, their privilege, and making sure that they're sharing information and curating intelligence and, and making sure that the folks that are actually defending the agency networks, whether that's in the agency SOCs, um, various cybersecurity teams have that information or are able to better defend their networks. So this is where, uh, this is where the, the architecture sits today. Operational visibility is a strategy and a plan that CISA has outlined for enabling access to data uh, for the people that really need it. So it's all about connecting the data with the decisions that need to be made and, and how we do that and how we gauge the efficacy with which we're doing that. There are two themes here that I wanna highlight and ultimately it becomes all about balance, right? Like a lot of things in life, you have to make trade-offs between sort of the, the risk and the reward or the cost and the reward, so to speak, for, for making some of these decisions in formulating an operational visibility framework. So the first picture that you see here is the pyramid of pain. This is also about 10 years old. They're all little study buddies in fourth grade here today. Uh, and the, the pyramid of pain represents a series of indicators of compromise and it, it shows them relative to the amount of pain that you can essentially cause an adversary if you deny them access to that particular indicator. So what we have at the bottom are things like IP addresses, hash values. If you detect a nefarious IP or hash value and you take it away from a threat actor, they'll just regenerate another one and they'll keep trying to, to get into your network. But as you move up the pyramid, it becomes ex extensively more complicated in terms of how you detect, track, and block but also more effective, because if you can take away an adversary's behavioral uh, norms, then, then that really does render them much less harmless to your organization. So in looking at the, the way that we structure the data that we need to collect as an organization, we're looking at balancing the various data elements that underlie each one of these indicators and making sure that we are, are balancing the, the automated detection techniques with the higher end behavioral detection techniques and looking at TTPs. So for TTPs, we're using the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So this is a framework that many of you I'm sure are familiar with. It maps the tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs, of threat actors in a way that is um, formulated so that you can, you, can, you can talk about what's happening, you can put it in the context of a framework, you can identify the underlying data elements that help inform that particular TTP and cybersecurity professionals can, can share information with one another. So the benefit of, of mapping data collection to the MITRE ATT&CK framework is that it essentially gives you an ability to gauge risks and gaps 
um, to prioritize your data collection methods. And if you can find certain data elements that are underlying more than one TTP, you can get sort of a bigger bang for your buck, so to speak, in terms of prioritizing the collection of those data elements. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're focusing on process logs, which are um, the, the underlying detection technique for many of the TTPs that are most widely exploited. So really it becomes all about the quote at the bottom of the page here. It's about integrating the people, the processes, the tools to automate the detection of the known, predict the unknowns, and then adapt to the unknown unknowns. I got through that. CDM has two primary programs in which they are uh, supporting the operational visibility strategy right now. The first is the government-wide deployment to endpoint detection and response systems. And what endpoint detection and response systems do is, as the name implies, uh, they detect incidents on an endpoint and they have the ability to respond and block those incidents in many cases. So this was a big part of the executive order from a couple of years ago and subsequent guidance out to federal agencies. It's been a massive push um, because as you can, you know, as we continue to shift sort of from the network perimeter to the endpoint, uh, EDR is really kind of the best solution at the endpoint level right now. So, so that is underway and it informs the M2201 guidance that I spoke to a few minutes ago. The second one here is CISA's host logging visibility initiative, which is in its pilot phase. And essentially what we're doing here is we're pulling those process logs from an endpoint and we're making them queryable at scale from the dashboards. And so the benefit of this is that you are able to dig into the logs directly and identify patterns associated with various threat actor techniques. And you can ultimately look to be more proactive in terms of how you're identifying and blocking threats. And so as you can imagine, the ability to do this at scale for all of the federal government is an incredibly valuable proposition. Okay, so with that, um, what does the future hold? With great data comes great responsibility, which is a catchphrase that um, I'm working on and I think we should all be adopting. So let's talk through what we've learned today and how we apply that in a real world scenario. So here we have, again, the CDM functional architecture. So data is collected at the agency level, it is aggregated, and it is accessible from a single federal dashboard that the CISA analysts are using on a daily basis. And that's our big elastic logo here. So let's pretend we are living the life of a CISA analyst. We've had a good breakfast, and we've been tracking a particular nefarious threat actor who seems to be originating from Australia and we're gonna call them Bad Baby Dingo. So Bad Baby Dingo is targeting a particular CVE and they're leveraging a flaw in the CVE to launch a process that will ultimately install a bad file and start to collect information. So from a TTP perspective, their, their intent here would be reconnaissance. So they've created this process file and let's call that Creepy Koala and they are deploying Creepy Koala on agency networks. So the way that you as a CISA analyst would find out that a CVE is potentially being exploited is through a variety of different mechanisms. And in order to, to look at the exposure of your federal systems to this particular CVE, you would use the federal dashboard. So you can come into the federal dashboard. We're doing this on a daily basis with our stakeholders across CISA, and you would look for the prevalence of that particular CVE. And let's say that you get 18,000 hits across the entire federal government, and 90% of the agencies have that CVE on their systems. It would take a lot of time to work with each one of those agencies and to manually parse through the logs to determine if they've been impacted by this creepy koala process. So instead, you leverage the federal dashboard again, you narrow your results down to just those particular endpoints, and you do a search for the process files that indicate that Creepy Koala has been exploited. And let's say in, in the process of doing that, you find 12 endpoints across two agencies that have been hit. So at this point, it, it's a much more manageable prospect for you to, to look at what's happening here. So you're pretty sure that Bad Baby Dingo has now breached two federal networks. You're gonna to pivot to the agency's EDR console, working in partnership with the agency SOC. 
And you're going to dive deeper into these systems to figure out what's going on and ultimately block the bad processes from happening. Uh, at this point, you have generally rendered this particular process and this threat actor with this process useless at this one agency. But there's hundreds of other agencies that are still unprotected. Here comes the role of CISA. So as a CISA analyst, you are now able to do a number of things. You can work with your peers to issue an activity alert um, and make sure that agency SOCs are on alert, that they understand the, the logs that ultimately they should be collecting to determine if Creepy Koala is creeping on their networks. You can um, issue configuration rules to augment their respective EDR deployments. You can put something in the federal dashboard to create a new detection for this process running on any federal networks. And you can get the CVE that started all of the issues added to CISA's known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. So all of these things orchestrating together ultimately render this particular tactic, this creepy koala, um, completely harmless. The dingo is not going to eat your baby. I could not help myself with that last one, I'm sorry. All right. So that's how we're helping CISA today. So in the future, what we're looking to do is pull in more data, more intelligence, and orchestrate these processes ultimately to identify, block bad things from happening, empower the people with the information that they need in order to better protect federal networks. I could not be more excited about the future of CDM and of CISA, and with technologies like Elastic behind us, it's a good time to be a cyber defender. Thank you so much.